And Jennifer, could you go to the next slide? Great, thank you. All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us. My name is Sarah Husky with 3C Ren. I've started recording this course, which will be posted on our on-demand page. Uh, we're here to talk about the 2022 Energy Code for non-res projects, but before we get into that, I uh, just have a few slides to run through. Uh, we ask that everyone just make sure they're on mute throughout the course. Uh, please ask questions in the chat. Uh, Grant from Inbalance will be monitoring the chat box as well as myself. Um, so we just encourage you to participate and ask questions and um, just make sure also that your profile name please uh, reflects your first and last name. It just it really helps with capturing attendance. So an introduction for those that are new, the Tri-County Regional Energy Network, also known as 3C Ren, is a collaborative partnership between the counties of San Luis Obispo, Santa Barbara, and Ventura, working to improve energy efficiency in our region by offering free programs and services for building professionals and households. 3C Ren is funded by ratepayer dollars, which are collected through the public goods charge found on our utility bills. 3C Ren currently offers three programs. Uh, the first of which is the Energy Code Connect program, which serves all building professionals by offering Title 24 support for residential and non-residential projects. Uh, this program offers a variety of services from trainings, such as the course we're all in today, Reach Code Support, Regional Forums, and the Energy Code Coach Service. Uh, Grant and Jennifer from Inbalance, the uh, instructors for today, are two of our coaches who provide Title 24 support for energy and Cal Green Code questions. Another program we offer is Building Performance Training, which serves building professionals by offering technical and soft skill trainings related to building science principles and high performance buildings. And we have our home energy savings program, which incentivizes contractors and helps residents save money and make their homes healthier with energy efficient upgrades through incentives and rebates. And with that, I'll pass things over to Jennifer from Imbalance Green Consulting. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm here uh, from Imbalance Green Consulting with 3C Ren and Grant Murphy is joining me also from Imbalance Green Consulting. Um, feel free to put questions in the chat. Grant's going to monitor the chat and jump in as um, needed if there's um, a discussion or something uh, relevant to a slide, put it in the chat and Grant can stop me and we can address that uh, question while we're on that slide. And this uh, course for today Energy Code 2022 updates. So a non-residential portion of the code is kind of the last one in this particular series. And I believe we'll be having um, recordings of these courses available. If you uh, missed any of those other events and we're gonna be um, kind of updating some of these for uh, more specifically for folks that are involved with the ICC um, coming up that um, we'll start doing that this month and through the summer. Today, we're going to review some of the kind of high level changes to the non-residential code. And we're going to take a look at some of the specific mandatory measures and touch on some of the performance and prescriptive changes. And then we'll touch a little bit on some of the highlights for the additions and alterations. Um, the code has been reorganized from the 2019 to the 2022. So we're going to touch on how that how the whole code has been reorganized. Okay. California Energy Commission, uh, just in case any of you are relatively new to the code, California Energy Commission, as part of Title 24, so Part 6, is the energy code is kind of reevaluated every three years. So it's on a triennial cycle, and we are 
now at January um, January 1st, 2023 is now the 2022 code start date. And the big picture goals by the state for the 2022 code updates is really to encourage heat pump technology for space heating and water heating. It was to expand the PV, so solar energy, solar electric PV systems and battery storage standards that go with it, to also to strengthen um, outside air ventilation standards and in the multifamily, single family um, projects was to require something we're calling electric ready. So it just makes it easier in the future for folks to um, change from maybe a gas ba based appliance to an electric based appliance and have that electric infrastructure already in place. Today, we're going to focus on mostly climate zones 4, 5, 6, 9, 16, that kind of area, because that is our uh, 3C Ren Tri County region of Ventura, Santa Barbara, and San Luis Obispo counties. We're going to hit on, um, you know, all the changes, but a couple examples and things will be specific to this region. And a great resource, of course, is going to be to log on to energy.ca.gov and the link is going to be provided. You guys are going to get a copy of the slides and this is where you can get the new energy standards that went into effect January 1st, but also if you're part of our Tri-County Regional Energy Network, um, our 3C REN has put the same documents in a, a really straightforward one place to find them, and that's in the resource library. And I think that's great, especially if you don't need to go through all the entire CEC's list of um, documents and other studies, but if you just want to get a hold of the main manuals, reference appendices, and the standards, you could go to our website here on 3C Ren. Okay, so um, let's see. I think we're probably doing pretty good. If there's any questions or comments about that, let me know. Otherwise, I'm gonna hit on how the energy code has been reorganized from the 2019 to the 2016. And briefly, under the 2019 code, and just in general, the energy code is divided up into certain sections that apply to all buildings. And then there was a big grouping of chapters that applied to high-rise residential, non-residential, hotel, motel, and other, um, other commercial uh, occupancies. And then there was a section for low rise residential or single family residential occupancies. And those multifamily residential occupancies were three stories or less that was in that section. And now under the 2022 code, there's three new uh, sections or chapters and it basically pulls out the multifamily buildings from the non-residential section and from the residential section. And it now has its new category. And another way of looking at that, um, and again, if you're relatively new to the code, you're gonna get a copy of the slide deck. And so you can take a look at how um, the, the energy code has been organized with the sub chapters and what topics they cover. and is basically section for everything for all occupancy types and then there was the low-rise residential and then everything that was not low-rise residential and under the new code we've got all occupancy types just the single family which can include duplex and townhomes and then the multi-family residences which are now the low-rise and the high-rise and um, then everything that's not residential, again, 
And that's the portion that we're going to cover today are these sections. So some of the big high level changes for the non residential is um, some updates to the envelope and fenestration fenestration meaning windows skylights glazed doors uh, there's been efficiency upgrades on the hvac heating ventilation air conditioning systems there's been some uh, efficiency updates on lighting both for indoor and outdoor there's been a number of uh, covered processes that are now addressed in the code there's a whole new section now for photovoltaic and battery systems specific to non-residential and high-rise residential occupancies. And just as a reminder, um, Hotel Motel is still under the non-residential occupancies and some of the code language uh, specifies whether it's gonna apply to the guest rooms only or to the non-residential spaces in general. Um, before we get into the actual code changes, I'd like to review a little bit of vocabulary, and you're going to hear us reference these terms. So mandatory requirements, that means the requirements are energy efficiency and measures that are applicable to all project types. And then the prescriptive pathway or prescriptive component package, these are the requirements that have within it some mandatory requirements, but they're basically following a checklist approach to the whole building or to the aspect of the building that you're working on, like the mechanical systems or the lighting systems or the envelope systems or all three. Um, it does function essentially as a checklist, but probably most importantly, the elements that are in the prescriptive component package are what is used for the performance method, which is the computer modeling method. And these mandatory um, requirements are also applicable, but within the energy modeling approach, there is trade-offs. So for example, there is, um, you can, uh, compliance, in other words, compliance under the computer modeling approach will address space heating and cooling, ventilation, which is outside air, water heating, indoor lighting, and now solar PV and battery storage. And these features can be traded off. So if you perform better in one area, you may be able to use that as a credit and maybe your project doesn't perform quite as well or meet that prescriptive requirement, which is a baseline in another aspect of the building. I think it's important to point out that when it does come to the solar electric and or battery systems, there are some specific requirements for it. And if you um, are involved with a project that could benefit from community shared solar electric or a community battery system, you should go in and read the sections uh, applicable to it and look to see if your project could um, comply with these standards by participating with community shared solar electric. There's two metrics now that are being used for the computer performance method. So if you're an architect um, and you're receiving your Title 24 performance documentation from your uh, consultants, you're now going to be looking at a couple of different metrics to see if that building passes. Maybe, maybe as the architect, you just want to know it passes, but your consultants are at least are going to be looking at okay, is it passing with what's called TDV, which is kind of the metric we were used to, and that's uh, based on um, what time of day that energy is being used. But there's a, an additional metric that's being re referred to as source energy, and that source energy metric is essentially as being used as a proxy 
for carbon emissions or carbon, it's a carbon based metric. So with these two metrics, we're going to have, um, we're going to have our new source energy that's being used as a proxy for carbon in new construction. And that is taking into account how the energy is being made and what is happening on site. It does include the PVs and the battery system within that metric. And then we have the TDV or time dependent valuation, which continues to be a metric for both efficiency of the building and the total TDV of the building, which also includes your uh, PV system and battery. And so what your um, results are gonna look like now, and this is an example from CBET.com with the office building project, is that if it meets that efficiency TDV, which is based on the efficiency of all the systems of the building itself before the PVs and battery, passes then you're good then you look at the total tdv which includes the battery and pv if you pass you're good and then it goes to the source energy metric which also looks at the pv and battery but this is where you can um for example um, increase the pv system to help boost your source energy and get that to pass. So you might end up with a PV system slightly bigger than what is the baseline. And that, that's kind of what we're finding for the source energy is sometimes the easiest way to do it. Any questions on that or any comments, Grant? Okay. No, none yet. Okay. When it comes to the mandatory measures, um, there the changes on paper are seem kind of minor, but maybe the implication is far reaching in terms of California's overall direction to keep increasing efficiency of equipment and to improve um, uh, California's ability to need less energy to condition and light our buildings. And under those mandatory measures, there's been quite a bit of update on equipment efficiencies. And even though this section applies to all the occupancies, the, these changes will mostly affect kind of the non-residential spaces for heating and cooling and um, mostly applicable to medium and large capacity systems. So the increased HVAC efficiencies um, are affecting various cooling systems, cooling towers, furnaces, and then already started in January is boilers. And then there's brand new efficiency tables for dedicated outdoor air systems, uh, computer room uh, cooling equipment, and heat pump and heat recovery chiller package systems. Under the glazing, um, one of the probably biggest changes here is that um, you're more and more as a designer or builder going to be using and relying on your glazing systems NFRC rated assembly. And so it used to be that you could have 2,000 square feet of glazing and, and your energy consultant or the architect could use do a formula for determining the value of the U factors, the whole solar heat gain coefficient for those assemblies. But that those formulas is called the NA6 formula. It's no longer valid for any vertical fenestration or vertical windows and glazing doors and you're limited to just under 200 square feet on the skylights so it basically means uh, as a builder and architect you're going to be looking at nfrc rated assemblies 
probably the next biggest change uh, under the mandatory measures. Uh, I think this is pretty significant it is under lighting demand response controls. So it used to be that you were designing a building and if the building were under, or rather if the building was 10,000 square feet over and over, your project would be subject to installing um, these demand response controls. But now the new threshold isn't based on the size of the building, it is based on the installed lighting power and it's 4,000 watts or greater. So that, so that's an architect, you're gonna to wanna to work with your uh, electrical lighting engineers and just understand that for a project, you may have not had to deal with uh, lighting demand response controls. And now you may be seeing that that's included in the project because of this different threshold. And then there are receptacles that also must be connected to the demand response system if the building is required to have demand controlled lighting. And then of course that doesn't apply to health um, or safety um, situations where that's not gonna um, work for obvious reasons. You don't want everything to turn off if there's emergency. Okay. Um, and the, uh, yeah, probably the other biggest takeaway is that the demand control response shall now reduce the lighting power by 15% or greater. And the demand control response, in case folks aren't familiar with that term, that's meaning that if there is a need for your state, for the grid system um, in your power district, if they're needing to reduce the load on the grid, they're going to send out that signal back to these buildings and then their lighting will be reduced by 15%. When it comes to the indoor lighting controls themselves, there's been a few, a few changes, but not a whole lot. And there's just been some update to the language. So there's gonna be some language now that specifies that scene controllers can be used if at least one scene turns off on general lighting only and the control provides a means to manually turn off all lighting. So I think that's kind of cool uh, change that you can use the scene controllers. Just um, the other day I went to a lighting show and um, got showed um, all these different options now that can be used in office buildings and other commercial projects, which uh, I think is going to be make it really creative for the architects and the lighting designers to use now the LED technology and change the whole mood of the space and that these controllers now can be used as part of your, um, your meeting your code requirement. The other probably big change now is that automatic daylighting controls are now mandatory in secondary daylight zones. So again, you're working uh, architects, you're working with your electrical lighting engineer, and they're going to um, now be specifying uh, these other types of controls where maybe you wouldn't have had it in the past prior code cycle. When it when it comes to the HVAC ventilation side of it, there's been some updates on the ventilation. And a lot of the, um, just kind of in general, a lot of the changes on the mechanical system is a bit nuanced. And unless we've got um, any mechanical engineers on the call right now, I probably won't go into a lot of the detail and I'm gonna try and hit the highlights that make sense for what the architects uh, would want to know and just to be aware of. So, the ventilation outdoor air is um, been updated. And I think the key kind of takeaway for you is that, that 
it may came may come up with your mechanical engineer is that um, a lot of this testing that's going to be done for making sure that your system is capable of maintaining the right amount of outside air was usually just reserved for constant volume systems but now that requirement is going to be applied to variable air volume systems so you you know uh you may hear about it but if you're a builder and you're doing commercial projects you can expect now that you're going to need to have the mechanical VAV system uh, measured and tested that it stays within 10% of the designed minimum outside air requirement. Also um, kind of new along those same lines is that there is um, HERS testing of the duct systems required and they're to verify that no more than 6% of the ducts do not have leakage to the outdoors. And this is um, for spaces now that are serving less than 5,000 square feet of floor conditioned area. And this used to be kind of a prescriptive component under the prior code cycle, but now it's a mandatory measure. For uh, process boilers, compressed air, steam traps, there's been some new language that is specific to these systems. Uh, I know in a lot of our areas, we're not dealing with a lot of this equipment, but if you are, you should take a look at the section 120.6 in the code and um, just kind of update yourself with what's now required. But the big kind of the big key takeaway is that the energy code is a trying to address cost effective ways to prevent energy loss unnecessary energy loss from boilers and the potentially non-functional steam traps and other failed compressed air systems uh, a good friend of mine works on these type of systems um, at one of the hospitals nearby and uh, he had commented that that the uh, these steam traps were something that they constantly were having to go in and test and um, be able to replace. So in a lot of ways, it makes sense now that it makes it into the mandatory measures for uh, the new code change. But again, these are pretty big systems and there's not a, a whole lot of them in our area. For computer rooms, which there are will be lots of computer rooms in our tri-county region for spaces that have a 20 watt per square foot of connected power density there are new hvac controls and efficiencies that must be um, must be met so if you're working and again you'll probably rely on your mechanical engineer at this point because if you're working on a uh, building uh, Let's see, we're working on a project right now that is has a very large computer server room. It definitely exceeds the 20 watts per square foot connected power density. And so this cooling equipment will have to meet these requirements. And this is a, this is a, a emergency dispatch facility. So projects like that that have a lot of computer equipment are now going to be affected. Um, controlled environmental horticulture. This whole section here under, um, and again, it'll be touched on under um, covered processes in that section of the code, but just as a mandatory kind of requirement, um, there's highlights of New grow lights must have a certain efficiency. They must have dimming and time lock controls. The dehumidifiers have now um, certain requirements they need to meet. And the greenhouse portion of it must have at least two glazing layers. And really this section is to address kind of this growing uh, cannabis um, 
sector. And the CEC had determined that a lot of the cannabis growing uh, facilities were quite energy intensive. So as a result, new mandatory controls or mandatory um, requirements So when it comes to new construction, there are prescriptive requirements and performance requirements. And there's been some minor changes to envelope lighting, service hot water, but there's been a couple of major changes to space conditioning and solar electric. Also with, uh, I would also add that one major change is um, the envelope assembly for metal stud walls. So we'll hit on that next. The code section 140 has is organized, generally speaking, you know, the first subsection of it just talks about the general requirements. Then there's a little bit of discussion on the performance approach, which we had already hit on with the new um, source metric and the TDV efficiency and, and total metric. And then the code goes into kind of the prescriptive approach and those requirements. And then after that, the code, it's organized into your building envelope, your conditioning systems, water heating systems, indoor lighting, outdoor lighting signs, the covered process, which we mentioned before, this kind of either computers or um, cannabis, and then the photovoltaic and battery storage systems. Um, I'm gonna kind of hit on a few of these highlights and let me know if there's any, um, any questions or comments or any projects you've worked on that you're wondering about. Um, when it comes to the roofing products, there's been some changes based on climate zone. So if you're, again, if you're working on a project prescriptively for the envelope, kind of the main takeaway is for climate zones two and four through 16, there's some new requirements for a steep slope roof and roofing products. And here we're talking about the solar reflectance index SRI and for climate zones six, seven, and eight, which is definitely in our tri-county region, there's new requirements for low slope uh, trade-off for age solar reflectance. It's, it's nuanced and it's basically saying the change is basically saying that the roofs need to be a little bit more reflective. So reject a little bit more heat. And what I recommend is that you, if you're gonna comply with the code prescriptively, the architects, you just go into this section of the code and kind of look up what that value is gonna be based on now your building framing type and the climate zone. So it does change based on your uh, building framing type. Grant, anything you wanna add on that? We just kind of went through that around and around the project. Yeah. Uh, we did have a question from Kevin. Uh, he was asking how it affects our clay tile roofs. uh how it affects the clay tile roof um meaning if you're so on a commercial project clay tile roof you're you know what we're gonna just have to look it up and find out specifically what change maybe is there but typically for our projects when we're working with clay tile roofs, we're, um, and if we're needing to make sure that they're venting properly, we're putting them up on a, a sleeper, but also we're finding that if you're dealing with a metal frame building anyway, you're gonna need a thermal uh, barrier. We're finding, and that kind of comes into play with the, um, 
metal framed buildings anyway, that exterior insulation is part of the new prescriptive requirement. And then there's trade-offs you can do. So you could have a little bit better insulation if your roof is not meeting those prescriptive requirements on the solar um, reflectance index. Yeah, the table in the bottom right. Kevin, let us know if that didn't answer your question. Yeah, and then you could definitely give us a real like specific question, like your project in the Code Coach, and we can dig that answer up for you for sure. Perfect. Okay, when it comes to the envelope, so we're just kind of mentioning that there's been some updates to these prescriptive uh, tables. And this, you know, the table is kind of set up by climate zone this this hasn't the format hasn't changed much but there's been a few changes and i went ahead and showed you the table that shows the 2019 code with the line crossed out and then the new code um, underlined and probably the biggest change really is on the metal framed walls where each of those u factors has gotten lower which means lowers better, lower means more insulation. And there are separate tables, just a reminder, they're separate tables for the guest rooms of hotel, motel, and um, relocatable public school buildings. And then of course the whole uh, residential, uh, high rise residential now is in its own section. And then the, um, that other change was that age solar reflectance and the thermal emittance, and in this case, the, the minimums required have gotten a little bit higher. But a lot of the rest of the tables prescriptively, not a lot of changes, but that um, metal stud wall is actually pretty dang significant. So when you take those U factors, and kind of translate them into what would you actually do as an architect and what maybe you might be looking at as um, someone who's out in the field and looking at a project based on their title 24 is that for example the even the mandatory minimum would be a two by four metal stud wall maybe there's an r13 bat in there but you'd have an exterior insulation of at least an R2. Okay, so that, that would be your minimum. And then for the climate zones one, six, and seven, you'd now be looking at adding an R12 exterior rigid insulation and maybe bumping up that wall assembly to an R15 cavity. Um, if you moved to a two by six stud wall that's metal stud and you can separate it out to 24 inches on center then for you know climate zone two four five eight sixteen for example now you'd meet those requirements with the r19 bat but still the r12 exterior continuous insulation so kind of the big um the big takeaway, I think, for the designers on this one to realize is that it may be possible to meet the area weighted average U factor without continuous insulation if the appropriate siding materials are used. But there's a big but it's going to be really hard to do that. So prescriptively, you're looking at having continuous exterior insulation, probably no matter what. And then performance, since this is being used as the baseline, the performance method most likely will still need the exterior rigid insulation because even though you can do trade offs, the prescriptive efficiency of your mechanical system and your lighting system has also gotten more efficient. So there just isn't going to be a lot of places to do trade offs with on the efficiency in the efficiency tdv metric 
So you've got to, so that's where this comes into play, and that you've got to meet that, that requirement. That's probably the biggest change to the uh, envelope on the non red standards right there. And then <clears throat> when it comes to the glass, the vertical fenestration, the windows and doors, um, it's just been reorganized. And now they're trying to have it set up so you can take a look at it by climate zone, which under the old code, it was not by climate zone, it was by window type. Now they're giving it to you by climate zone and by window type. So for climate zone nine, which is down in Santa Barbara, and then 11 through 15, there's some new values for the fixed window type. And in climate zone one and also climate zone seven, which is down in Ventura, there's um, some new values for the curtain wall or storefront window type. And then the operable windows, glazed door systems, oops, um, those values are still the same across all climate zones. And then, then we move on to uh, kind of the bigger picture changes for the space conditioning systems. And the main takeaway here is that where the CEC, where the case studies were demonstrated um, cost effectiveness, the new baseline is a heat pump. And where that's true, and again, it's dependent on occupancy type and then climate zone type. So for example, if, you know, the first bullet point, if you're in a school building space, climate zones two through 15, heat pump is now your new uh, prescriptive requirement or your baseline. But if you're in climate zone one through 16, it's a dual fuel heat pump. And by dual fuel, it means you'd still have a gas furnace in there and um, you would have the heat pump that has the ability to um, kick in when the outdoor temperatures, when everything is right for that heat pump to run very efficiently, the heat pump's gonna be operating. And then when that isn't the case, then the gas furnace portion of that system will kick in. And I just got done working with a client outside of California, but the concept is still the same because they're just north of California in Oregon. And the person installing these systems said they're getting a lot of uh, traction with the dual, dual fuel heat pump in those colder climates in Northern California and, um, and um, Oregon. So, and then the same kind of thing is followed through for the retail, grocery building, office, financial, library spaces, et cetera. Depending on the climate zone, you're gonna have a heat pump. And then for office spaces within warehouses, all the climate zones are gonna be a heat pump. And then there is um, some exceptions and that's where systems utilize recovered heat for the space heating. And that's, you'll have to look at that uh, topic by topic. And the big push for the heat pumps, kind of that big picture, is that California is looking at ways to rely less on fossil fuels and kind of shift towards renewable energy like solar and wind and um, share energy with uh, northern states and Canada for large uh, hydro. That's kind of the big picture. So when it comes down to now these prescriptive changes on the heating and cooling system, the code looks different than how it did in the sense that there are now tables, and this is just an excerpt of the table, but there are tables um, that really detail out how is this fan system being used? In other words, is it a supply system for spaces serving um, more than an area six floors away? Or is it a, a 
fan system that also has MERV 13 to MERV 16 filters upstream of the thermal, I mean, upstream of the thermal conditioning equipment, et cetera, et cetera. And so those, those items continue on down the list. And then you have to know, is this a VAV system uh, less than 5,000 CFM? That means cubic feet per minute of airflow coming through that space. Is it higher, um, et cetera, et cetera. So really the architects on the call, I think you just know that, okay, this is the kind of stuff your uh, mechanical engineer is gonna work with. And they would look up the system types and then meet these now fan power budget requirements. And what, what we're noticing is that the fans are a big deal in the performance compliance method because now all the fans in our system are being are being these things are being used as the baseline. I think the other uh, kind of thing to note is that it addresses now fans that are one kilowatt or larger and previously that was called a five horsepower fan, um, which is equivalent to about 3.7 kilowatt uh, system. So now we're taking what used to just be considered the concerns of large fan systems and bringing that down to a fan system that's about a third um, the size of what it previously was. There's been some updates on the economizers associated with that and um, dedicated outside air systems. Again, it's a nuance, but the main takeaway is that there's just a broadening application of requirements for economizers um, for lower capacity units. And there are certain trade-offs that are allowed. There's a table your engineer can look up and there's also some uh, new exceptions where you are using a dedicated outside air with exhaust heat recovery. And um, there's also exceptions for those controlled environmental horticulture spaces, like what we were talking about with the cannabis growing, where carbon dioxide enrichment is actually required or desired. So those, of course, on purpose, you're not ventilating those as much because you want the carbon dioxide to build up. Uh, for very large systems, there's some new capacity um, requirements for the heating gas boiler systems. And uh, again, if you're working on a large project like this, your mechanical engineer needs to look it up and it is based on climate zone. And a lot of our climate zones are four, we have four, five, and six, so it'll be affected by this. The really mild one, seven, eight, no, won't apply. Um, but the kind of the big takeaway here is that these boilers to reach this new requirement of this 90% efficiency, it means they must have some kind of condensing capability. And um, boilers that are in the same building, but if they're on separate loops, they're not considered to be the same system. So there is a system size trigger as well. So this is really for large systems um, in certain climate zones. When it comes to dedicated outdoor air systems, this whole section's been rewritten. And we're, um, we're seeing dedicated outdoor air systems more and more as they're being combined with heat pump technology. And we're seeing it as a way to meet these new efficiency standards. Uh, uh, they could be small scale ones that you might see that could be for a small office or residence, which would be indicative of the, the three inch to six inch duct size um, you see in the picture, or it could be uh, for really big, big ducted systems for large commercial spaces. And um, 
I don't know, Grant, anything you want to add on the dedicated outside air systems? We are seeing a lot of these now. No, I, I don't have anything to add on the dedicated outside air systems. Okay. Um, I have a, I have a uh, envelope question if you want to change gears yeah. or do you want to yeah, wait? Yeah, let's do it. Uh, <clears throat> George asks, um, if building and safety departments are allowing encroachment into setbacks for continuous insulation in renovations. Um, I remember this being like a legal argument from the CEC, um, but I haven't had any projects that actually, you know, we've brought it up and then they've decided, the design teams have decided, hey, that's not worth our effort, you know? Um, is that still valid? What's What's your recent update on it? <clears throat> Um, I don't have anything, unfortunately, I wish I had something more to add. I don't right now because like you, I mean, the last couple of projects we worked on where it came up, the design team just decided to mitigate away from needing the exterior insulation in the couple of places that it was required. And I remember on one multifamily project, it just was a portion of one of the walls and they just said okay forget it and we did performance method and they were able to get a not need it so i don't know if there's anyone on the cec who knows the answer to that please uh put it in the chat because we would we would we would that would be good to know in general yeah exactly um oh <clears throat> Ed said he has a jurisdiction that allowed it into the setback. It was in a county up north, though, not in 3C Ren territory. Yeah, and uh, one of um, you know, one of the other projects we worked on, were, the issue for it was that they had gone through all these planning and building approvals already, and so they were down to the just down to the fraction of an inch to meet all their ADA requirements in this multifamily housing project. And so it just even wasn't possible to squeeze any area out of anything. And so they kind of went around and around and that's where they decided, okay, just this one wall on the one side that was a short wall, they'll just take it off because they, yeah, they just, it wasn't worth it. So. Yeah. George, uh, George think, followed up and he said, um, if they don't allow the encroachment, how do you mitigate it? Performance method, correct. That would be the way to mitigate it. Uh, and then he asked, does it work to condition the wall space to reduce humidity and provide the continuous insulation to be placed at an interior side of wall? Um, uh, conditioning your wall space is a interesting um, way to phrase that, but you can put continuous insulation on the interior side of your wall. You could do furring to the interior. You know, there's lots of solutions in that way, regard, but um, I, I wouldn't necessarily say we're conditioning a wall space to uh, mitigate any code item. Yeah, and in the case of the ADA compliance, so accessibility compliance, um, that other project that we looked at that too and it just we they weren't able to make it work yeah. um i had one from kevin that asked are air barriers now required in the sb zone <clears throat> air barriers are required across all the zones now i think that's going to come up next okay. uh for in a couple Great. slides um and by SB, do you mean Santa Barbara areas? Or I, I assume so, Kevin. Chai, yes, he said yes. Okay. Yeah. Great. It's now, coming up. So. Yeah. Yeah. It's. Thanks, Jennifer. Okay. Um. So, anyways, okay. Updates on the dedicated outdoor air systems. Um. Let's see. I. This is a quick. Uh, let's see, I got to skip this slide. It's a picture. Okay, there we go. <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> hey, uh, was it somehow I uh, forgot to get rid of that slide out of the slide deck. So sorry about that. Okay, so to give you an idea of what this uh, heat recovery ventilation system looks like. Um, uh, and this is the kind of thing that's now we're looking at as being part of these prescriptive changes. And if you're not familiar with this as a technology, basically what the, there, one way to do it is to have a thin membrane um, kind of multi-channel pathway that allows air coming out of the building. And in this case, in this diagram, let's say uh, there's warm air inside the building because we're in heating mode, that warm air as it's exhausted out of the building, it's going to run past in outside air that's cold and they're going to cross paths without touching each other, but they're going to transfer the heat. So in other words, the exhaust air cools off, but the incoming air is tempered. And so now it's the, the fresh outside air is pre-warmed, so it's not a blast of cold air. So this kind of heat recovery is being used on those dedicated outdoor air systems so that the introduction of fresh outside air isn't just super cold when it comes into the building or super hot when it comes into the building. Um, these, uh, this whole section on the dedicated outdoor air system is basically meant to eliminate extra energy waste. And there are certain requirements for it about how it shall uh, cycle off any zone heating equipment fans um, when there's no call for heating or cooling in the zone, for example. And then there's certain fan requirements based on you know, the input power. So there's new tables for this. Again, it's kind of nuanced, just going to highlight that those tables exist. So if you're on the mechanical engineering side of it, you're going to want to go into these tables and take a look and see what's changed. And it is based on outdoor airflow at full design capacity and uh, the percentage of the outside air that's intro introduced. And, um, you know, there's two tables depending on uh, the hours in the year that this is uh, going on. So also with this new section, there's discussion on the sensible energy recovery uh, ratio. And it needs to be at least 60% or an enthalpy recovery ratio of at least 50%. And it's based on the AHRI conditions. Um, I, what I'm noticing is that now, like um, Daikin, this, this one, and other brands, Stop. for example, are on, computer. What's that? Did someone... Uh, ask a question. Okay. Um, okay, sorry about that. Um, but anyway, there's um, the equipment, the DOAS equipment that are doing the exhaust. They're having uh, these units now that are more available by many manufacturers that are including uh, heat recovery flywheels for improved efficiency. And um, it's a slightly different method than the one I showed you previously. But again, on the mechanical engineering side of it, I'd say, you know, go to these sections and then also start asking your favorite manufacturers what product lines they're offering now. And then on the domestic hot water side of things, um, the kind of the biggest change is that, uh, for example, school buildings, climate zones two through 15, a heat pump water heater, often shortened HPWH, heat pump water heater system, um, 25,000 square feet or less under four story school building, that would be the baseline now. And for hotel and motel occupancies, 
you're going to follow the same requirements under the multifamily section. So they kind of direct you to that. And again, you can now use heat pump water heating systems to meet these requirements. So I think that's great. And then I put some pictures down there of what that looks like. And we've seen these uh, Sanco 2 units uh, with multiple outdoor condensing units going to large storage tanks being used for multifamily and um, uh, hotel motel or hotel occupancies. And then now uh, several brands are coming out with larger scale heat pump water heating systems and like the one on the right for example gets 250 uh, gallons for the first hour um, so there's some options out there so again if you're on the uh, mechanical engineering side of it or the architect side of it and you're looking to move towards an all-electric project um, really pay attention to your hot water heating options for indoor lighting, the biggest change, given that LED light is so available now for all kinds of lighting situations, basically the allowed amount of light it measured in watts, so our lighting power density is reduced. And it's kind of been reduced um, across the board. So this is where I think as an architect, you're gonna have more options for working with lighting designers to do more creative things because of the lights available now that are in lower wattages because of LED technology. And then your electrical lighting engineer will need to just follow these new prescriptive measures. The other thing is there was a sweet spot under the old code for a little while where the LED lighting technology was there but the code allowable amount of watts, the power density was fairly high. So you can get a pretty good credit there and use it as a trade-off under the computer method for other things. So it just gives you heads up, the designers, a lot of the ways it was used was to get rid of exterior rigid insulation, for example. But now with the indoor lighting, load uh, power density kind of matching the technology much closer you may not get that trade-off so we're really seeing a push now where the architects are have to kind of like quote unquote sort of pull their weight on the envelope when they're doing a project under the performance method so. on the outdoor lighting um Again, you're probably, this is mostly going to be up to your, you know, electrical lighting engineer. Um, but a couple of things that I think are interesting from the outdoor lighting perspective is that we now have these two categories of urban, where it's an urbanized area and an urban cluster. And those are based on uh, the 2010 census. and the Census Bureau's definitions under the 2010. And the reason I'm mentioning 2010 like multiple times, I don't know if folks paid any attention, but under the census for 2020, it was kind of a big deal because the definitions got changed and how it's categorized. So to be clear, when you're working on the energy code of california it's the 2010 census and these definitions and you'll have to use um, these maps if you're not sure if your project is considered an urban cluster or an urbanized area um, and that affects like how much light you can have on the exterior is based on whether it falls in rural, urban cluster, urbanized area. And then a um, little bonus like security cameras, there's now a budget for those in applications where you do have an illuminated general hardscape. The covered processes for the computer rooms, it's just here's an example of the table. If you know you're working on a project with computer rooms, your electrical, I mean, sorry, your um, 
you know, your mechanical engineer working with your uh, the computer tech folks for that building, they're going to need to determine what the power density is for that space and then look up what needs to be the efficiency, the COP, the coefficient of performance based on uh, climate zone. So there's just been a big move on a lot of this stuff to really look at what makes sense, what's cost effective for a particular climate zone. And again, there's new tables also uh, for the UPSs for the uninterrupted power supply for those computer rooms. It's a nuance, You're gonna wanna look that up. And then when we come here to our photovoltaic, um, requirements. It's now prescriptive requirement, meaning it's also going to show up in your performance method. Um, but this prescriptive requirement is not only based on climate zone, it's also based on the occupancy type. And that there's going to be a formula that you would follow to determine how much PV you need. And it's possible in some cases that you do this formula for how much PV you need based on the condition floor area of your building or your, your occupancy type. And it's, if that ends up being a very large system, you can also look at your solar roof area and take that and multiply it times 14 watts per square foot to determine the wattage of the solar system. And you pick whichever one is the smaller. Um, there, you do have to, it's additive if it's a mixed occupancy group, for example. And that solar access roof area, this is to be determined by taking a look at the roof and figuring out how much of that roof will have over 70% of the annual solar insulation or solar access. And that's what you use. And you can use the roof on your covered parking spaces, carports, or any other newly constructed structure on site that's capable of supporting a PV system. And I just ran through an example here for you, but and this is mostly for the architects, just to get kind of a rough idea of how you start designing your project so that you're going to have some idea and enough space for where you're going to put the PV system. So you really do want to, I think, as a designer, be more proactive and just run some quick numbers. And in this example, um, I'm not looking at the high rise residential tower on the right that already had its own PV will have its own PV calculation, but just the PVs for the uh, two story portion on the left in this project and there's restaurant space retail space office and lease space. And I had already calculated that there was um, a solar roof area that was going to be fully in sun that it was like. 4,500 square feet. So using the tables in that previous chart, you know, I calculated it, then it came out with 33 kilowatts of space. Or you can do the 14 watts for the roof area, divide by 1,000 to get kilowatts, and it's 63 kilowatts. Okay, so we go with the 33 kilowatt DC size in this example. And you're going to get a copy of the slide. So if this is useful to the architects, um, this part isn't really in. It's the formulas in the code, but I put this in here for the architects so they can start to understand how that formula would be used. So it's practical for them. And so, for example, if you know that you're going to have that 33,000 watt size or 33 kilowatt size you could look up a commercial uh, pv panel and take a look at the nominal power in watts 
and take that size, divide it by that nominal power in watts. And in this case, it says we need 70.2 panels. Okay, we'll call it round up, we we'll call it 71 panels. And you're gonna be able to also get the dimensions of that panel. And as an average, I would allow like a half an inch in between the panel. So I would just add an inch to that panel. So as an architect, you can just start to lay out these panels and get an idea of how much space you need. And this is just kind of a rule of thumb to make sure you're moving in the right direction for that. Battery storage systems. Uh, at this point, you probably, you can run the formulas and they're, it's, you know, it's an, it's similar idea that it's based on um, occupancy type and it's additive if you have more than one occupancy type but there's two formulas you would follow and it's going to tell you what size battery storage system you need so far i haven't had any architects who want to run through these numbers but i have had a couple of electrical uh, engineers tell me that they've been running this and, and, and using the prescriptive as a estimate for their clients on how much battery they're going to be required. And there are some exceptions to this. Um, so for example, if it turns out that in the end, your battery uh, rated capacity that is required is less than 10 kilowatt hours, you won't need it. And if the installed PV system size is less than 15% of the size determined by that prior equation, you don't need it. And climate zone one, which isn't in our area, but if you are uh, working in climate zone one, there's no battery storage system required for offices, schools, and warehouses. Now, I think one interesting thing to point out um, back to this table, if you are working on schools and that just happens to be your thing just take special note that schools these factors are almost double what the other factors are so schools are going to be the ones that will have the largest battery sizes and that's partly for how to um, have resiliency and to keep schools up and running and considering that all our kids are there just FYI on that. For the additions and alterations, there's just a couple of highlights I want to touch on. And um, the most of the alterations, you're going to take a look at this and go into this whole chapter of uh, section 141 and 141 and take a look at it. Usually alterations, additions are kind of nuanced, but I think that the 2022 non-residential multifamily compliance manual uh, did a really good job of having numerous alteration scenarios with the potential cost-effective solutions and considerations. And this is especially, I think, true when it comes for the roofing and re-roofing and what is triggering that for the roofing the re-roofing gets into that question about the um what you do with um you know an existing building and the um clay roofs and clay roof tiles and also what the hvac rooftop equipment um is going to need so i highly recommend you take a look at that and there's some other things here, like um, when 25% more of the building envelope wall area is altered, it now needs to meet the air barrier design and material requirements for newly constructed buildings. So that's kind of a new deal. And um, there's, you're gonna wanna look up the actual requirements for the air barrier detailing and blower door testing that's needed. And there is a section here you'll wanna uh, read up on for visual inspection and diagnostic evaluation for that in the non-residential appendices 
and that's just part of what you need to do if the air leakage rate exceeds the 0.4 CFM per square foot. So the main takeaway here is that it's worth it to look up the stuff in the manual if this is an area of concern that you have, something you're working on, and the California Energy Code is really just looking at how to make these non-residential -resi buildings tighter. When it comes to the alteration um, for roofing alterations, it is triggered that when 50% or 2,000 square feet existing roofs is replaced or recovered, the new requirements um, are triggered and they're is some new continuous insulation requirements. So this could be kind of a big deal or a new thing for a lot of folks where they're not expecting that and thinking that their climate is mild so they won't need to do exterior rigid. But when they're when you when this is triggered, you're looking at um, at least an R10 above roof deck to meet these requirements. So it's higher than it was in the past. Also for the additions and alterations, um, for the HVAC equipment alterations, there's, there's new uh, fan power allowances that you would follow. Uh, it's a little bit different. This is just an excerpt from the table in section 141.0. And this is when you're replacing the space conditioning system. And then there's some new um, triggers for duck alterations. And uh, a duck is considered new if you're replacing 70 five percent of that duct system and that does include like the ducts themselves the connectors and um, all the other components that go into that system so 75 percent of it's being replaced okay then you're going to have to seal that uh on that duct system and have it hers tested to less than six percent leakage and if it's just a duct extension on your constant volume, uh, single zone systems, and it's serving less than 5,000 square feet, it also has to be sealed and hers tested to less than 15%. So they're trying to mirror a bit of the prescriptive requirements under new construction, um, but it's a little nuanced. So if you know you're working on an alteration, you're gonna wanna just come in and read the section that's specific to the type of alteration that you're doing in uh, section 141 or um, you know call your code coach to help you out on that and for the water heating alterations um, it's basically saying for your service water heating they shall meet all the requirements of section 140.5 a and b which means they're sending you back to the prescriptive requirements for new construction when you're, re when you're replacing that water heating system. Okay, so, um, and uh, there's a reminder, these are the prescriptive changes, which means these are the ones that are gonna be the baseline and you can still show your additions and alterations via the performance model and, um, engage in trade-offs with some of these things and play around with that. And then last but not least, as a reminder, the non-residential energy code is fairly nuanced and it's going to be very specific now to the either type of equipment, the type of work you're doing, uh, whether it's going to be in the mechanical systems for heating and cooling space or ventilation or hot water. PVs, batteries, whether it's additions, alterations, each of those sections um, deserves its own multi-hours class to actually go through it. It's quite entailed, but this uh, class was to just give you kind of that 
big picture overview of some of the main things that are changing to give you a heads up of where to be aware that things might be different that could impact your design or what you're doing in your jurisdiction. And 3C Wren offers the Code Coach service. Grant and I are both uh, Code Coaches, and you can get a hold of us through um, 3C Wren or 3c-ren.org and go to the Energy Code Coach section, and then from there navigate to ask your questions. And I am going to let Sarah um tell us a little bit more about upcoming classes and then we've got some time to answer questions and grant and i are available um you guys can um unmute or raise your hand or put something in the chat and then we can address any questions you have for the remainder of the time yeah thanks jennifer uh, so just uh, in closing, there's continuing education units available uh, for the, today's class, both AIA and ICC. Um, it, feel free to send me an email if you need to provide your numbers for credit. Uh, and then the slides and the recording will be provided in an email. Uh, it'll be sent out probably tomorrow. Um, there's also a survey. If you could take that, it really helps us um, kind of gauge current and future courses. Uh, along those same lines, I'll just go ahead and launch a uh, really quick poll uh, through Zoom just for some uh, you know, additional feedback. It, it really helps us out. Uh, and then as far as upcoming courses, we have a bunch uh, in May and June. Uh, our calendars are busy, so there's lots of different types of courses coming up. Um, when you get these slides, these hyperlinks take you to the event page and you can also go to our calendar on our website as well. Um, so yeah, with that, we can open it up for questions. Yeah, people, please send in any questions you have now or we can, of course, chat using the Code Coach service. Um, George here had a big picture question. Um, he was wondering about the unintended implications of these new rules on the waste management side, <clears throat> saying that electrical and other building components wear out and utilizing materials such as adobe, clay, straw, <clears throat> what, <clears throat> excuse me, are, um, you know, why, why aren't we using that, I assume is his question or, or is an alternative. I know um, the waste management side is being handled a little bit in Cal Green, but uh, it really isn't part of what the energy code is targeting. And those alternative design and construction materials are still valid, um, although they're not common. And um, the energy code does account for them if you want to use them. But like I said, it's just not a common building material these days in the mass construction industry. Fun conversation to talk about for sure. We can talk about that for a while, but um, does anyone have non-res or, or really just any energy code specific questions? Yeah, I mean, shoot, it can be a question too that deals with the multifamily as well, because it does overlap, especially yeah. with high rise residential. It used to be in this section of the code. And if you noted on the PV tables, they, there is there was a category for uh high rise residential still in the pv table and then that table is repeated again in the multifamily so there's mixed use um yeah. you know there's definitely that mixed use where you would have a project where you'd look at the multifamily portion of it like the tower like i showed you that would have the pv calculation and then the the all the support non-res spaces with their uh, PV requirement. Yeah, California in general is really moving towards how to reduce the impact of producing electricity 
via fossil fuels. And so even though California, our energy grid is a lot cleaner and we've kind of hit, according to CEC, we've hit this tipping point where 59, 60% of our energy is from renewable sources. We still have a portion of energy electricity that's produced from gas uh, power plants, natural gas power plants. So uh, what you might notice when you work with your energy consultants on some of your projects in 2022 <laughs> is with that carbon <laughs> metric, yeah. if you're going to be looking at, <laughs> sorry, going to be looking at, oh no, my building seems to be energy efficient enough with the TDV and I've got the right amount of PVs on my building per the total TDV and now I don't have a compliant building because my carbon emissions isn't what it's supposed to be and that's where uh, additional battery storage could take care of that or uh, additional PVs with battery storage could take care of that portion of it because now you're depending more on that self-utilization of your own energy that you've stored and not dependent on these gas um, electric peaker plants that run when the sun isn't shining, essentially. <laughs> yeah. George followed up with that and... Um offered up his his solution. I think you're you're touching on the carbon, the upcoming carbon code. That stuff is is super relevant to what he's asking. Um, you know, how how do we, you know, account for this this other side of it? Uh, he mentioned commissioning. Uh, we're still working on getting fundamental commissioning, which is part of the current code and required for new construction buildings over 10,000 square feet um, to be enforced. So the idea of commissioning based uh, you know, real performance verification that you mentioned, um, it, it, it would be a difficult ask considering where the commissioning is at currently. Um, but the idea of trading off that versus, um, you know, incorporating materials, I think right now what the code is doing is, as Jennifer mentioned, it's going with this uh, capturing the carbon side of it um, and then continuing to push the electrification that way the state can handle generation yeah and Brenda, i would just say as a if you're a designer on the call architect on the call or you know any of the consultants too i think it's going to be interesting to look at that performance method and just see what what you can push and pull to deal with that carbon proxy that that's going to be kind of new for a lot of us so that one example I gave you, um, where I showed you oh, all of them passed, it, it technically it needed the extra PV in the battery to get that carbon kind of imp, that carbon metric over the um, threshold, so to speak. Um, the carbon metric just on the heating itself was fit not meeting, and then it was uh then the trade-off was that it was the project itself was doing better on the electric uh, uh lighting and the cooling water was just neutral how they were heating the hot water so if i were working on that office building there's probably not a lot i could do on the hot water heating just because an office building doesn't need a lot of hot water so the obvious solution on that one was to say okay you might need more battery storage and pv and and, and jennifer also he, he uh george was bringing up you know materials materials currently are not incorporated as part of this right so like actually you're building assembly um you know the the carbon based or the the efficiency basis on a um uh actual energy intensity of the material is not part of the energy code um now isn't jennifer you want to talk about the upcoming the carbon code a little bit i mean it's interesting yeah it's changing okay so that was a moving target um and there is going to be um concretes like the biggest 
mm -hmm. the biggest carbon emitter that's being looked <laughs> at currently being considered by California. And Andy, um, she was, who also uh, is one of our co-instructors, she was just telling me that um, so it's changed again. Like the, it's just the California <laughs> hasn't settled in exactly on if they're going to do it like a building that's 50,000 square feet or bigger. And I think that's where I thought that's where it was kind of settling. But I think she mentioned that that's changing. So before I say too much, I want to actually look it up and see what the most recent language that's being put forward will be. And um, I could just tell you that it's concrete. It's like all about concrete yeah. right now as far as embodied carbon emissions. George, George, you're right. Our values and you values are part of the code. So you're right in that regard. Um, and, and a great question about the, you know, straw, site, soil mix, you, 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 even lumber. There are a number of alternative materials that, should I say, are, are, are approved or already tested by the CEC. So they give us the opportunity to use those like a straw bale wall. Uh, by code straw bale, they give us an R30 for, oh gosh, uh, a cross section of 22 inch by 16 inch. They give us an R30 for that. But what you're describing a site soil mixed with straw, that's a whole different, that's not a tested product for C, by the CEC that can show that can allow everyone to use a value for it across the state. So you definitely fall into this um, alternative compliance world where unfortunately, in my experience, without testing and throwing money at it, you end up using a D-rated value and you don't get to see the credit you might <clears throat> because it's not proven. So, um, but there's log home walls is in there, uh, straw bale, you know, uh, ICF, stuff like that. All right. Yeah. Well, great conversation and questions. Thank you all for staying a few minutes after um, after 11. Uh, but we'll go ahead and end it here. And again, the recording and slides will be sent to your email. And if there's any follow-up questions, please feel free to reach out with our Energy Code Coach service um and grant or jennifer will be in touch and with that we'll go ahead and end it thank you all thanks everyone thanks everyone